എല്ലാവർക്കും ഒരിക്കൽ കൂടി നമസ്കാരം യൂത്ത് കോൺക്ലേവിൻ്റെ ഭാഗമായി നടക്കുന്ന ഹിന്ദു മഹാസമ്മേളനത്തിൻ്റെ ഭാഗമായി നടക്കുന്ന യൂത്ത് കോൺക്ലേവിൻ്റെ ഇന്നത്തെ അവസാനത്തെ സെഷനിലേക്ക് നമ്മൾ കടക്കുകയാണ് സോ ഫോർ ദ കൺവീനിയൻസ് ഐ ബി സ്വിച്ചിങ് ടു ഇംഗ്ലീഷ് സോ ഐ ബിലീവ് ദ ടോപ്പിക് ഫോർ ടുഡേ ഈസ് വെരി റെലവൻറ്റ് വി ഹാവ് ബീൻ ഡിസ്കസിങ് ഡിഫറെൻറ്റ് ടോപ്പിക്സ് ഫ്രം ഡിഫറെൻറ്റ് സ്ഫിയേഴ്സ് ഫ്രം ദ പാസ്റ്റ് ടു ഡേയ്സ് ആൻഡ് ഐ ബിലീവ് ദ ടോപ്പിക് ഫോർ ടുഡേ സെഷൻ ഇസ് വെരി റെലവൻറ്റ് ആൻഡ് വി ഹാവ് എ വെരി ഡിസ്റ്റിംഗ്വിഷ്ഡ് ഗെസ്റ്റ് വിത്ത് ആസ് ടുഡേ ടു ഡിസ്കസ് ദ സെയിം so the topic for today's session is rise of hindutva politics as a global power clues from early 21st century we have the media personality the author writer i i don't know how to introduce this person this this person absolutely need no introduction but but i will have to read out some uh, anand ragadhan ji is a consulting editor and columnist for swarajya he has written previously for news laundry dna and the news minute anand ji a heartly welcome to you to trivandrum first of all so anand ji without any delay i would like to enter directly into the topic so as an introductory part we have the youth conclave here as a part of hindu maha sammelan here in trivandrum so how do you feel being here on the stage with these audience how do you feel for an introductory statement and then we'll switch to the questions first of all thank you so much uh, arjun and for the organizers for having me or uh, this incredible uh, uh, org- uh, conference and i i think over the ensuing one hour we would have a very enriching debate uh, and i'd like uh, the audience to participate as much as possible and uh, that this function is happening in right in the middle of uh, in kerala reminds i am from jnu so this is like having a a ganesh chaturthi in the middle of jnu <laughs> feels like home <laughs> um as i say there are only three places uh where communists are present um in uh, jnu in kerala and in the media so um for how long i don't know um but the to- the topic that we have chosen i think is very relevant uh especially because um uh this, this phrase that you have added 21st century so even though the the terminology of hindutva uh, i'm i'm sorry uh, were you going to have a question answer session then we can have that and then we can yeah sorry for the inconvenience so anand ji as an as a as a first question of the session i would like to ask you how do you think the hindutva politics have influenced the people of world's largest democracy because over the past few years hindutva politics has been discussed when we when we speak about politics uh, the opposition or whosoever the leaders are they are more concerned about speaking politics as an hindutva politics and they have different narratives for the same so how far do you think the hindutva politics has influenced the people of india right so uh, just to um, give some background and explain to you how relevant your question is and it indeed is uh, let me actually uh, quote from the conclusion of the supreme court uh, in its 1995 landmark judgment where it says uh, hindutva means the indian culture and not merely the hindu religion and the the uh, the judgment that was given by the supreme court bench was packed with so called left liberals in fact the chief justice or the 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 judge the chief um, uh, judge who pronounced this judgment was justice verma who was the liberal hero so this distinction that is deliberately made by the left and islamists that hinduism is good hindutva is bad it is basically to draw a false equivalence between um hinduism and islam so that you can project uh, hinduism is as good as islam but hindutva is as bad as isis so uh, that is how they want to throw bricks at hindutva without understanding that twa uh, the literal meaning of twa is essence so hindutva even if you don't want to project it as something which is 
exactly what Hinduism is, way of life. It is the essence of Hinduism. And if, even if you were to digress a little bit from the so-called dictionary definition of Hindutva, it is at best uh, a reaction to protect Hinduism. So it is a defensive force. It is, a, it is to counter the attack on Hinduism. It does not, for example, call for the annihilation of non-Hindus, um, like not just ISIS, but Islam does. So the false equivalence is basically to, um, to cushion the reality of Abrahamic religions, and in particular Islam. And if we have to talk about Hindutva, right in the middle of a communist stronghold, one has to be really fearless about it, not to be politically correct. And when I when I'm going to quote a few Islamic verses, uh, you know, I'm quoting them, I'm not criticizing them. The problem comes is that people who are of that particular religion, they, they are themselves embarrassed at listening, hearing those verses and the fact that those very verses are imbibed by two billion people, they are embarrassed about it. Now, I can't do anything about that. So the fact of the matter is that whenever you have to talk about, let us say, Taliban or what the Taliban are doing, they say, oh, uh, they're, they're like Hindutva, they're like Hindutva forces, you know, they are as bad as Hindutva without realizing that the Taliban are not uh, at variance from what the book is telling them to. They are exactly following what the book is telling them. So this is a complete false equivalence. And as I say, is it Hindutva that tells that non-Hindus, i.e. Muslims are the worst of creatures? Is it Hindutva that says that if you do not follow our verses or Vedas, you will be roasted in hell. No. It is an open challenge to anyone who hates Hindutva to tell me five things that are there in Hindutva that are not already there in Islam. Five things. Forget five, just tell me two. And if you can't, would those people who hate Hindutva start hating Islam as well? So it's very easy to expose the hypocrisy because the hypocrisy stems from the acute embarrassment of following something that tells you that these are the people who are to be hated. You know, non-followers, non-followers or non-believers are to be hated. Hindutva doesn't say that. So, now that we understand the background of what Hindutva is, your question as to how relevant it is in the 21st century, I think it is incredibly relevant. I think it is one of the most relevant things that can happen because the second thing that people do is when they lose an argument is that they say, oh, why are you talking about Hindu, Muslim, Hindu, Muslim all the time? Well, religion is the great definer of our philosophy. It has been for a thousand years, maybe more than thousand years. Why shouldn't we talk about Hindu, Muslim? We should because we should expose not just the ills of religion, we should expose the religion. Remember, it is religion that is responsible for almost, if not all the actions that any political party takes. And I am saying it very objectively. You have in Germany, you have in Britain, you have in, in USA. So many of the steps are taken to prove that you are a good Christian. You know, there are parties that are named on Christian Democrats, whatever that may mean. You have the American president taking oaths uh, uh, in the name of God. So religion is all pervasive. To say that you mustn't talk about religion or Islam is to already have lost the argument. Now, how does that come into relevance into what we are talking? The more you talk of Hindutva, the more you explain what Hindutva is, the more you will understand what Islam is. The more you will understand what other religions are. And I think you can't you have to be very fearless about it because when you, when you talk about 21st century, I could include 2000 to 2004 in that as well, which was the Vajpayee government. They were very squeamish about these topics. They were very squeamish if I am to be very honest about it. Right now, the present generation, 20 years have passed, they are not squeamish. They, are, they say it's alright to discuss 
it is all right to discuss hindutva you can call me a sanghi so people call me sanghi all the time it's, it's fine call me whatever you want it doesn't bother me at all rahul roshan a, a very good friend of mine has written a book uh, the sanghi who never went to shakha uh, i am also one of you can call me if you call me a sanghi i have never visited a shakha although i would love to but the fact of the matter is these labels don't matter anymore what matters is what you put on the table and what you put on the table is explaining what hindutva is explaining the terribly false equivalence that people make comparing hindutva to isis or to a bad version of a religion when it is not that at all so the more we talk about hindutva the more we will realize that it is one of the most important things that you can talk about in today's world see and and when we when we look into it there is a very interesting fact that uh, in the 21st century they start speaking about hindutva politics and they delve into the religion they they switch to hindu religion as such they start speaking about hindu hindu hindutva politics there's a purposeful agenda that is being driven to demonize the hindutva politics that uh, telling the people that hindutva politics is something that is very uh, dangerous see uh the hindutva politics has always been in this in this country the congress has you know uh, always uh, been in a soft hindutva line for the past many years and the thing is there is a purposeful propaganda for for instance i'll tell you see uh, there there was a legislation brought by the indian government that was of caa when they protest for caa it is a legislation made by the indian government to give citizenship for the minority communities in pakistan the protest started and then the whole thing shifted from a constitutional amendment or a or a or a right to protect a minority brothers or minority brothers who who are suffering in another country the whole narrative shifted to hindutva politics shifted to bjp and then to jai shri ram then to slogans and then uh, you know uh, the i know you are from jnu and and then the campuses told it, it totally shifted how 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 do you see this purposeful agenda that is being brought out yeah no i think this uh, to be very honest this remains a recurring problem with with the bjp and i've said this before that the congress is a master at deception whereas the bjp is a disaster at perception most of the policies that the bjp has tried to put in implemented or tried to implement were actually congress policies in fact the farm bills were in the congress manifesto <laughs> so bjp would have thought obviously nobody will protest i will face modi must have thought i will face no protest because i am fulfilling the congress manifesto but of course you know how hypocritical congress is that you know they they started protesting the implementation of things that were there in their manifesto because they hate modi they hate everything that bjp does but coming back to this did you know for example that the caa was there was a resolution passed by the congress demanding citizenship for bangladeshi minorities now who are bangladeshi minorities they obviously can't be muslims right they are hindus christians and sikhs so it was the congress that demanded that they be given citizenship but when bjp gives it then there is un cry there is a communist resolution cpim resolution demanding citizenship for bangladeshi minorities demanding it but when bjp does it oh this is a sang ideology this is a sang experiment and all that the fact of the matter is that you have to go beyond exposing the hypocrisy and be resolute in your decision this is the problem with them because they are not they are if you are on the side of truth i don't want to sound like a preacher but if you are on the side of, side of truth nothing can deter you nothing must deter you if for example mr modi had made up his mind and it was fantastic that the farm laws are great for the farmers he should not have repealed them he should not have but that's a separate matter we don't have time to go into that but i want to uh, you know again uh, tell you how facetious the arguments are you see if you look around the world most of the media that is dictated by the left most of these so called human right activists 
all these activist journalists. They celebrate the bringing down of statues of Confederacy generals, of Cecil Rhodes, of King Leopold, you know, all those hitherto so-called white gods that have committed terrible crimes. For example, the, the king of um, Belgium is directly responsible for the murder of so many millions of uh, people from Congo, you know, terrible atrocities. When his statue is brought down illegally, they just bring it down, they cheer. But when Hindus want to go through the courts to have their Ram temple on something that was illegally brought down and a masjid built on top, then you say this is Hindutva politics. How is this Hindutva politics if you are fighting for, uh, uh, to correct and to demand historical justice or to correct historical injustice? How is this Hindutva politics? I am an atheist. In fact, since morning, there's a lot of controversy on Twitter because I went to Sri Padmanabha Swami temple, I tweeted and people are saying, oh, atheist has gone there. <laughs> Are bhai, atheist hi jate hain. But, so people are saying, why, why are you uh, for the Ram temple? And beyond that, why do you want Kashi and Mathura also? Of course I want it. And I'm not saying it as a Hindu. I'm saying it as an Indian. Why should Indian not fight to correct a historical injustice? So next time a leftist tells that, look, this is, you are playing Hindutva politics by demanding Kashi, by demanding that the mosque be removed and the, the mandir be made resplendent again in Kashi Vishwanath or in Mathura, which the temple was demolished by. There you don't even need a proof that there was a temple because the temple already exists. You can see parts of the temple in, in Kashi Vishwanath. It's such a horrendous sight. Why should you not fight legally? But our country has been, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the play of such devious thoughts that I'm sure you know there is something called the 1991 Places of Worship Act, which this parliament, Indian parliament passed, which is that you cannot change the shape or structure of any place of worship in India as it stood on 15th August 1947. And in the Ayodhya judgment, the Supreme Court has ratified it, has said that Places of Worship Act is good, it should stand. So what that means is that if I as an Indian demand that that obnoxious Gyan Vyapi mosque that has been put by destroying the Kashi Vishwanath temple should be removed or displaced, technology exists to, even if you don't want to destroy it, even if the, the courts legally do not sanction you to destroy it, you can certainly displace it. But I cannot fight for it because the Places of Worship Act would have to be abrogated. The Supreme Court judgment would have to be abrogated. Now I am standing for truth. I am standing for what the left also stands for around the world. Why am I wrong and they right? And I don't understand why has it taken three years for this government to uh, uh, you know, just sit silent and not abrogate the Places of Worship Act. You can, you can keep on shouting from the rooftops that we want a, a temple we want Kashi Vishwanath temple back, but unless you abrogate Places of Worship Act, you're not going to get it. You have the majority. I don't know. Do, does the BGP government have the majority? I'm not very sure. I don't know how many seats they have in the parliament. Maybe 100 seats, I don't know. So let us wait when they get majority, 300 seats. Maybe then they will be able to act. But what I'm trying to say is that we have to stand resolutely on what you believe in. And if that, what you believe in, is, is based on truth and justice. Nothing should be able to deter you. Uh, and, and the chronology is really interesting, Anandji. When, uh, when there was the first UPA government and when the second UPA government came in, at that point of time, if you observe the channel discussions, there was no much references about Hindutva politics. There was no much references because they, they debate issues on the meritorious basis. If it is about constitution, they debate about constitution. If it is about another scam, they debate about the scam. They, they, they do the debate very meritoriously. But what happened was, uh, after the UPA government, uh, after the UPA, uh, UPA sec uh, the second UPA government, when, uh, when the BJP government came into the power, 
how do you think the media had a role the media of the country had a role in the same in in bringing up hindutva politics into the mainstream and demonizing it how far do you think the media has a has a has a role in this because every time you open the 9 pm debate you have a have a person from the left or the congress or anyone they will be having a reference beat whatsoever the debate is they will be having a reference on hindutva beat whatsoever the tro- topic is even even if it is a topic of ukraine uh, ukraine and the uh, russia issue they have a issue with a prime minister talking with the uh, with the concerned people to have a concerns so there is a reference of hindutva politics in each and every channel discussions so how far do you think the media persons of the country has a role in demonizing the hindutva politics no th- that's a terrific question and if i can hark back to 2009 2010 when we were all quote unquote kids in terms of understanding and analyzing indian politics there used to be this giant called media crooks he's still there i think but uh, this useless twitter banned him three four times so i think that thing is not there anymore he was he was the boss he was a genius at analy- he was the first one a pioneer who analyzes and i think i might be wrong uh, i can can't remember exactly but he said media is the first defense for all this crook crooks and politicians and that is so true whatever the politicians wanted to do and i'm you're talking of the upa time it would first the first defense would always be the media and it's going back 10 years 8 9 years but i don't know if you remember there used to be this phrase called um, sonia gandhi upset and every time something happened sonia upset with something sonia upset with something you know so media had rahul gandhi is evolving everything media had this kind of a, a quanta uh, you know set phrases that they would use to def- now when you talk of hindutva politics and especially the upa years and the media the way i, I mean of course it would be like condensing 10 years into uh, you know two minutes but let me try and do that because essentially three or four things happened one was this talk about you are indulging in hindutva politics if you are talking of the ram temple you are indulging in hindutva t- politics if you are against secularism these are essentially the two things that the opposition and congress demonized anyone who wanted this these two things and anyone who would be at variance with their thought process so let me delve into those i think i've already talked about ram temple why shouldn't one demand or shouldn't have one demanded uh, ram temple because it was to correct a historical injustice now let me delve on this secularism because they say oh you want hindu rashtra then they try and scare say look this is again secularism ours is a secular country well first of all ours is not a secular country ours is a plural country secondly the word secularism was inserted by indira gandhi in our constitution during the emergency of all places just look at the irony so it was not there in our original preamble of our constitution that was the architect of which was dr ambedkar thirdly how on earth can you call yourself a secular country when you control only hindu temples when you tax only hindu temples when you have government boards only for hindu temples and not for mosques or gurdwaras or churches is that secularism when you leech billions and billions of dollars only from hindu temples how is that secular and it is the same upa government that wanted to bring in the communal violence bill i don't know whether you remember 10 years ago thank god it was shelved but the crux of that communal violence bill was that no matter whatever riot happens the majority would always be responsible for the riot so even if the riot were to happen in let's say the valley in kashmir where 99% people are muslims because they are categorized as minority in india you would find three or four hindus and because they would be majority they would be responsible for the so these are the kind of things that this country has gone through so i am not surprised that people saw through that and people want to understand that the facade that is going on in the name of religion has to be stopped there are everything that the congress is trying to wishy wash by saying this is religious is actually religion agnostic 
I am not religious, but I demand the Ram temple, I demand Kashi, I demand Mathura. I am not religious. And religion has got nothing to do with it. It is justice and truth. See, uh, and, and, and when we look deep into that, Ananji, there is a very interesting fact as well. Uh, during the time of UP elections, we see Rahul Gandhi and Priyanka Gandhi nowadays going for visiting the temples and worshipping the gods, goddesses and, and, and congress profiles always posted down the social media during the UP elections. And the interesting fact is, as, as we mentioned about the Ram Temple, the primary issue the media and the congress in particular in the beginning stages had was uh, the if the Ram Temple is being uh, made there, it is, a, it is a communal move by Sankh Parivar government in the beginning stages. But when the word it, word it came, things were going on the right track, the problem of the media was no other person, no other person from the Congress is being invited, no other person from any other political party is being invited, and the Prime Minister of the country is being invited for the ceremony. So it was a problem for them. So my primary question is, when the election comes, they visit the temples, they worship the goddesses, they want the pictures to be clicked. When the ceremony of the Ram temple is happening, they want them to be invited, they want them to be given the priority. So, so, so what is their issue? The, the, what is the basic issue these people really have uh, regarding this thing? So, on one side they say that Hindutva, is, Hindutva politics is a really bad thing and they do this seasonal bhakti, we say. So, they do this seasonal worshipping for their political benefits. So, how do you see no, that? Now, I think even seasonal worshipping would be a problem because if I'm not mistaken, Miss Smriti Rani is visiting Vainard. So, she is actually chasing Rahul. She is, she is not satisfied with the... She is not satisfied with thrashing him in Amethi. Now, now, now she is going to beat him in Vainard and then maybe she is going to contest from Bangkok where Rahul Gandhi visits. Then in 2029, maybe she might be contesting from Italy, some place in Italy where Rahul Gandhi might be contesting. So, my humble request to Smriti Rani is please, please stop chasing Rahul Gandhi. <laughs> no, but you are absolutely right. See, th this, is, this is what I call when you don't stand for truth and when you don't have the resolve in your mind, then it is, as you say, you straddle between two stools and you fall. So, they are not very clear what they want. They just think that, you know, you have this ready, quote-unquote, Hindu vote bank. So, let us do appeasement for five years and, you know, or four years, 11 months and that one month let us go to this Hindu vote bank and they would, they would be fooled by us and they would go ahead and do it. The problem is, I, I keep repeating, the problem is not the Congress. The Congress is gone. It's been eight years. The problem is that Indians and Hindus have to now demand action from the government which is there right now. That is the issue. Are we, are Hindus demanding? Let us talk about the temple issue, the government control of temple. 1959, Congress government overturned a Supreme Court judgment and took control of temples. That almost 70 years, 1959, okay? What was stopping BJP government from abrogating that? It's been eight years. But no, it wants more control of Hindu temples. So, uh, the tragedy is not, co Congress is, is almost, it's almost Congress Mukt Bharat, except for two states and some universities here or there. The question is, you voted in a government, you have to demand action from that government. Now the CAA, even the notification has not been done for three years. Why? The excuse always comes out that there was COVID. Hey, things don't run in, uh, you know, series. They run in parallel. Just because COVID happened, did the government stop doing all the hundreds of things that it was doing? So, uh, you know, Congress is history. The, the point is that you, you brought in a government. People demand some action. And to be very honest, in Uttar Pradesh, people are getting that action. People demanded law and order. They are getting law and order. In other BJP states, you see a lot of disturbances. 
In other BJP states, all hell breaks loose if you want to dismantle an illegal loudspeaker. The other day, Yogi Adityanath made an order. The next day, 30,000 illegal loudspeakers were voluntarily brought down. What does that end from both mosques and temples? It is not an appeasement or it is not going after religion. Forget about the Western media that talks about Muslim genocide is happening. So you have 800 uh, Shobha Yatras, stones are pelted on a huge majority of them. And then you, next day you read that Muslim genocide is happening. I mean, uh, you have to really, uh, the mind boggles at what kind of, uh, uh, you know, deviousness is going on. But ignore that. People have voted you for something. Fulfill that. Fulfill your promises and then move ahead. See, and uh, I believe uh, that in, in making the Hindutva politics a continuous discussion for the past many years, I believe there is a series of cherry-picked events yes. from 2014. 2014 was the turning point in Indian politics where UPA lost very, very, very pathetically and, and then we had a government. So, uh, so the thing is, from 2014 onwards, they cherry pick events. They repeat the stories of Godra. Yes. They they take up certain events which is happening in the remotest part of India. They they take up certain mob lynchings that is happening in the remotest part of UP. UP has been the center point for many of the media's in making this Hindutva politics narrative stay alive in the media. See, they want this uh, things to be made alive through the through the years so how far do you think this cherry picking politics politics of cherry picking and 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 as uh, as you are from jnu they even use the campuses see when there is a when there is a protest happening see delhi is being the center point of protest jnu is being the center point of protest as you said liberals are being now confined into jnu media and kerala so so how do you see this Politics of cherry picking. I'll just point out one more incident. See, when there is the issue, of when, when, when the slogan comes of Jay Sri Ram, and when in during the protest for CAA, there was slogans of La ilaha illallah. And when the question was asked, they were saying that people should be energized, and for the purpose, we need slogans like this. People from Jamia Millia Islamia University said this on media to ANI, to NDTV. So, how do you see this cherry picking politics played by media and my second question, adding on to the same, how do you see uh, this politics of uh, 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 drawing a thick line between Jay Sri Ram and La Ilaha Illallah? Yeah, so that's a very interesting question. Uh, two uh, arms to it. Number one, about the cherry picking first. Now, this has been going on since 2014. And it is very apparent that this is based on a fake narrative and uh, complete propaganda. Because if you remember, they will always bring out selectively. They will always talk about the lynchings and attempted lynchings, uh, hate attacks by Hindu mobs on Muslims. But they will never ever talk about the same or more number of lynchings and attempted lynchings and hate attacks by Muslim mobs on Hindus, Dalits and non-Dalits. So I have written on this, so many people have written on it. There are n number of, in fact I used to have a, a thread, running thread of documenting all these instances where Muslim mobs had lynched Hindus, but they never made the news. The point is that there is an obvious agenda and it started from 2014 with the fake church attacks if you remember. You know the churches are being attacked by Hindus. Ultimately it turned out that they were normal robberies, they were you know some stones being pelted there, there was normal arson. And more number of churches had been attacked during the UPA than they were during the NDA. This came out three months after the whole church attack narrative. But during those three months, this government proved to be totally ineffective in combating that. For three months, every newspaper in India and abroad was saying that Christians are under attack. Even Times of India ran a huge banner saying Christians under attack. Very Christians say, enough, please stop harassing us and all that. Complete bunkum. But for three months, the Hindus were pilloried, Indians were humiliated. People said, look, this is horrible what is happening and all fake news. So this is not going to stop. Even today, it won't stop. Because these instances happen with alarming regularity. Every time 
a Muslim mob lynches or attempted to attempts to lynch a Hindu, a Dalit or a non-Dalit, it is ignored. And I've, I've said this before so many times that you remember the name of Akhlaq. You don't remember the name of Bharat Yadav. If I ask in the audience who was Bharat Yadav, hardly one or two hands would go up. In fact, let me take a... How many of you know who Bharat Yadav is? Not one hand has gone up. How many of you know who Akhlaq was? There we go. Majority. So, Bharat Yadav was a, a lassi seller who was called a kafir and lynched by a Muslim mob. Right? You, you have instances of this quote-unquote love jihad in Kerala. For decades, Hindus were saying this is happening. The phrase love jihad has been given by the, the Kerala court. But when the Christians started worrying about it, then the media is kind of, oh man, now we can no longer ignore it. Because uh, the, the Hindus were talking, we can ignore that. But now the Christians are talking, so there has to be some... So why is this selectivity? And this, now coming back to the first question that you asked, this is what I really would want the audience and everyone else, including me, to understand that most of the things that the opposition accuses BJP of are not Hindutva issues. Ram Temple, for me, is not a Hindutva issue. Kashi Vishwanath is not a Hindutva issue. CAA is not a Hindutva issue. Name one issue which BJP wants to project as a Hindutva issue. It, BJP is not a Hindutva political party. <laughs> it's not. So, I, you know, it maybe it helps them politically to keep quiet when somebody accuses them of being a Hindutva. That is a separate matter, that they are playing politics. But the fact of the matter is that these are issues that every Indian should stand up and fight for, demand for. I mean, the, the fact that they are calling CAA as anti-Muslim just tells the vacuity of their intellectual thought. They are saying, why don't you include Muslims in there? First of all, the Muslims of this country, the political parties, uh, OAC, AIMIM, they don't even consider Ahmadiyyas as Muslims. You ask them, I asked once point blank. He was silent, he was not able to reply. Ahmadiyya, they are Muslims, but the Muslims of India don't consider themselves so. They don't want persecuted Muslims from Pakistan to come to India if they are Ahmadiyyas. Now, most of these countries are either Islamic republics or they have Islam as a state religion. Afghanistan, Pakistan, even Bangladesh. Now, to say that Muslims should also be allowed to come using this act is ridiculous because Millions and millions of Shias are being persecuted in Islamic republics. Should India suddenly become a home for 300 million Shias? What's going on here? You have a country, you have an Islamic republic, you have a religion of Islam, your courts follow that religion. But if within Islam you want to discriminate against this thing, how is India responsible for taking in 300 million Shias? It's, it's absurd. You can't do that. But the moment you explain it, you become Islamophobic. Islamophobic. You know, it, it doesn't, after a while, it doesn't, labels don't stick if you stand for truth. So, secondly, what people don't understand when they say this is Hindutva propaganda, CAA is as far removed from Hindutva as you can possibly get. It is asking for Christians, it is asking for Buddhists, for Sikhs to be grouped with Hindus who are persecuted to be brought back to redress the balance of the thing that was not completed in 1950 during the Liaquat Act. Secondly, the most important thing that many people forget from both the right and the left is that this is an amnesty. This is not a blanket acceptance of everyone will be given citizenship. There has to be a cooling off period. 31st December 2014 was that whoever came before that would be given citizenship. After that, after notification, that hasn't even been done. So to say that this is a Hindutva ploy, this is, is, is complete nonsense and it, it must be rejected by all intelligent people. About non-intelligent people, you can't do anything. See, Anand, uh, see, Anandji, uh, the basic problem is these people oppose Hindutva politics. See, for instance, if you take a look, 
opposing hindu to politics is not a crime since what they say is they have the freedom of speech and expression it it's absolutely fine but when it comes to protest and issues there is a there is a very thin line which they draw between hindutva politics hindus and then this uh, you know this country bharat india they have a problem for for instance when the protest starts uh, suddenly there is a design that comes to the protest certain organizations come in they have a design for the protest so then first they start with hindutva politics then they go on to hindus then they go on to nation they 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 say that this country is not fine at all they keep on saying that we have this problem this is the thing they keep on expressing themselves and finally in a 9 pm debate they say that in this country we don't have a freedom of speech and expression so how do you see this line hindutva politics they have a design a, a very clear design first they start with hindu starting with hindutva politics and then to going anti national how do you how do you see that line which they draw yeah so uh, first of all this is the second time you're saying that they come on 9 pm debates and they talk so i also come on 9 pm debates but i definitely me make that distinction but uh, as as i said i have already proved to you on i think five issues that were erstwhile thought of as hindutva issues that not hindutva issues at all i challenge anyone to tell me what is hindutva politics i don't get it it is not hindutva politics as so somebody tells you what is hindutva politics i honestly don't have an i mean you uh, if, if you want hindu rashtra you can say right okay you want uh, uh, you know hindutva politics but has prime minister said that we want a hindu rashtra secondly what are the parameters of hindu rashtra how are we not sure that we already have a hindu rashtra given the fact that the honorable governor of kerala has said that if at all secularism has been allowed to prosper in this country is because this is a hindu majority country which i truly believe is a fact you go to the muslim majority countries around you and you would very quickly experience what secularism is you know so the fact of the matter is we might already without knowing be living in a hindu rashtra so even that is not hindutva politics so what is hindutva politics ucc may okay now this another bogey is going to come that this is hindutva politics you, uh, you know um, uh, civil code ucc how the hell is that hindutva when the supreme court itself has asked for it when our constitution of india has a directive principle imploring the states to have it ucc where does hindutva come in it this is what indians want so the fact of the matter is that and this, this is a classic case of a goebbels propaganda accuse the other person of what you are guilty of this is what i'm saying you 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 indulge in snow stone pelting and the next day you say that you are being pelted upon which is so bizarre but this is how propaganda works I, I, when we throw it open for audience questioning i would love to ask you what according to you is give me one issue which can be said as hindutva politics because i cannot shall we throw it okay. open to the okay. audience how much time we have just a sure. final question and then we will throw it to the audience since you are from jnu i cannot avoid this question see uh, the students which are from this uh, i study in hyderabad central university so the people especially the students which come from kerala they seriously don't have an idea what hindutva politics is especially the liberal students jo bhi hai this communist party so they don't have a distinction what is Hindu, what hindutva politics really is they say that hindutva politics is dangerous how do you think uh, the liberal ideological people have been able to how do you think they have been able to maintain this ecosystem in the universities of the country so uh, first of all if i may uh, slightly correct you uh, we must stop labeling them as liberal they are anything but liberal they are dictatorial they are demagogues they don't believe in democracy they don't believe in liberalism at all okay the truest liberal would be 
if at all you were to go and search, would probably find a Hindu is a true liberal. So when you address them as liberal, please put quotes on top of the liberal. So they're, they're not liberal at all. And when they, you're talking about brainwashing in the universities. Now, let me not go there because I think I've criticized this government enough, but all right, I'll criticize it one more time. You see, you have eight years to change the textbooks. You've done nothing. You have your ministers who said we are proud not to have even changed one comma in our textbooks. How do you expect the students not to be brainwashed? When the students are reading that Shea Guevara, who was a homophobic mass murderer, was great. When the students are wearing t-shirts having Shea, when my good friend Rahul Ishwar eulogizes Shea Guevara and says Hinduism needs an icon like Shea Guevara, when every book that is prescribed in our universities is steeped in ignorance and eulogizing Mao and Pol Pot and Stalin, Aurangzeb, Tipu Sultan, how on earth do you expect students not to be brainwashed? In fact, I would say that the collective audience in this room, it is a miracle that these people and I and you are not brainwashed, having gone through the same books. So I really congratulate you. Despite reading our books, if you have not been brainwashed, I think that is the real miracle. So many things have come out and the left doesn't want that. So you see someone like True Indology, you know, who was a fantastic handle, who was exposing all these charlatans. He's been banned for months, fourth, fifth time. Why? Because he exposed Aurangzeb, because he exposed Tipu Sultan, because he exposed all those fraud historians that call themselves historian, that the left says they are historians. Did you know, for example, I didn't until I read the book by uh, the excellent uh, Sanjeev Sanyal, The Ocean of Churn, that uh, I didn't know this, that Ashoka was already a Buddhist for four to eight years before he undertook the Kalinga war and killed millions. He was already a Buddhist. But what do you see in our textbooks? that he saw these bodies splayed around and he was so humiliated and embarrassed that he turned to Buddhism. These are the things that we've studied about Aurangzeb, about so many other things, Mughals. So when you have books that haven't changed, why shouldn't student, in fact, a good student would be one who is brainwashed. That means he's reading those books very well and he's passing the exams well. So I would, I would encourage students to be brainwashed that means that they are doing their studies very well. Okay. So I was being sarcastic there. Please don't. Yes. And we have been talking for around 45 minutes now. And now we will throw the questions to the audience. Those who want to ask questions can put your hands up and the mic will be passed to you. Let me check this mic if this is okay. Okay. I request the coordinators to kindly pass mic to the people who want to ask the question. I request everyone to be precise on the question so that we can have a very good elaborated answer from Anand sir. And I would request any of you, if you've thought of a Hindutva politics issue, please let me know. Rangnathan ji, I'm a great fan of yours. You. I was most of your 9 p.m. debates. Thank you. You are great and you show great courage. So uh, I want to talk, I want, I have questions about two things. It's not questions, I need some clarity. It's about the hijab judgment of the High Court in Karnataka. And uh, it's about the movie Kashmiri Files. Till the m movie, everyone was talking about freedom of speech and expression. So after the release of the movie Kashmiri Files, uh, uh, the narrative was changed and that was being, a, being showcased as a propaganda movie. And one more request. So we are living in a Kerala where you know the minority is not minority anymore. So can you please tell us some verses in the great holy book, Quran, about the lynching of Kafirs? Thank okay. you. Well, let me... I, I don't want to wrongly quote because then as you know, Gustake Rasul ki ek hi saza, sartan se juda. But, uh, before, before I do that, uh, yeah, so you asked uh, three questions. One was your hijab judgment. So believe it or not, I actually am against the hijab judgment. 
although I am, I believe that hijab is an op a symbol of oppression. I have said this, but the fact of the matter is that uh, the, I mean, uh, the Almighty Allah, and I may sound like Zakir Naik here, so apologies for that, but uh, has meticulously described how uh, a woman should dress. And now, when you have that description, in yes. Right. So, uh, so m my take is that I am against the High Court judgment that has banned hijab. Because either you ban all religious symbols, you don't do that. Um, so, you allow the Sikh uh, to wear turbans. When clearly in Quran it is written how a woman should dress, it is almost, if not, the, the burqa has been given, the hijab has definitely been shown the verses I can in fact quote you those verses. In fact, let me do that. Uh, but they failed to portray that it was in a compulsory religious Yeah, practice, so right? that again, how, how does one say what is essential and what is not essential in religion? Is it up to the judge? According to me, it is up to the believer. If what is written in the Quran, every word of Quran has to be followed is sacrosanct. That is what makes a true Muslim. And if the words and the verses in the Quran tell you this is how you should wear, this is how you should dress, then according to me that is essential. So I, I think the High Court has erred and the Supreme Court is possibly going to overturn that judgment. But um, I, I wanted to, uh, yeah, the dress code. So here is where I want to. Tell the believing women to reduce their vision and guard their private parts and not expose their adornment except that which appears thereof and to wrap a portion of their head covers over their chests and not to expose their adornment except to their husbands, their fathers, their husbands' fathers, their sons, their husbands' sons their brothers, their husbands' sons, their brothers' sons, their sisters' sons, their women, that which their right hands possess, or those male attendants having no physical desire, or children who are not yet aware of the private aspects of women. 2431. O Prophet, tell your wives, and your daughters and the women of the believers to bring down over themselves part of their outer garments. That is more suitable that they will be known and not be abused and ever is Allah forgiving and merciful 3359. Now these are the two verses. Now as a true Muslim, you are bound by Allah's edict to follow them. If a Muslim woman is following them, she is a true Muslim. She believes it is essential to her being a Muslim. So. That's why I was against the High Court judgment. No, but, uh, the uniform is different. If the school or the university says that this is what you're going to wear to come to our school. Yeah, that, that's what the, the yeah, that, that, that's the point. It's and the, there is no discrimination. So you cannot say that the Muslims, while following the Quranic verses, mm. they cannot come in burqa or hijab, but the Sikhs can, wearing their turban. That is discrimination according to me. Yeah, that is discrimination, but that is uh, even before the independence, it was there for six. So, yeah, yeah. but at the same time, even the institution has got its rights, like an individual. Yes, so, so but the, if the institution is discriminatory, mm. is it discriminatory or is it not? Mm. So, according to me, if you do not overtly show your religious symbol mm. or, you know, some adornment, mm. that is still fine. So, you can, you can have a, a, a you know, some, some religious symbol, you don't have to overtly show it. Mm. And if it is followed across all religions, according to me, that should not be a problem. Uh, after all, after all, let me say this, um, circumcision is a religious edict as well. Now, circumcised students go to universities and schools, don't they? But thank God, we, they, they don't show it to, yeah. So it's fine. I, I guess we'll switch to the next question. Yeah, no, what was the two, next question? Two more, uh, about the Kashmiri no, files? Uh, I guess we'll go to the second person, I guess. So, because the time is very limited, we have yeah. to close the session. Sure, but we'll I hope I answered your question. Yeah. 
we'll go to the second question i request you to be precise has any of you thought of a hindutva Hello. issue please tell me let me know uh, what about the security threat posed by wearing uh, full covered uh, fully co covered uh, parda S suppose uh, somebody is walking fully body fully covered in public road whether it's a ma it can be man or woman right i'm sorry so would you did you get that can you please repeat the question once no there, there's a security threat posed by wearing a fully covered parda right? can you please hold your mic in, yeah yeah, yeah there, uh, there's a security threat posed by wearing a fully covered parda right so we cannot know where is a man or woman walking in public road did you get the question uh, he was asking that about the hijab issue yes uh, he was telling that when the parda is being wore, uh, yes. wore there is a security threat because yes. we cannot identify the person yes. like when when yes. students so are coming into the institutions we yes. have a problem in identifying this yes students. yes so that was his question to be precise no that's and i have said this before security is a legitimate concern so burqa being banned in schools and universities one can understand but hijab is a hijab is just the covering of the head it's not yeah Yes, to the next question, yes. Okay. Namaste, Anandji. Uh, I'll make it fast. First of all, I appreciate you for identifying yourself or tagging yourself as a, an atheist because yes. I strongly believe that uh, it is only in Hindutva where we can identify yes. ourselves as an atheist yes. because we have Chavaga philosophy. I appreciate you for that. And uh, my question is, uh, last day, uh, the director of uh, Kashmir Files, Vivek Agnihotri, sir, has... Uh, he was sitting here, he gave an excellent speech and after that, a Malayalam channel. Yes, I saw that. <laughs> yes, she has done an interview. Her name is Madhu. I should say that a journalist should never be such intolerant to a person to whom she is interviewing. Yes. Right. So, I, I wanted to specify her name uh, specifically here. That is one thing. And my question is that, why leftists are so much uh, empathetical or sympathetical to Islamists. Okay. What would be the reason or what is a common factor? Yes. Very interesting question. Number one, I, I saw the interview of my good friend Vivek. It was absolutely hilarious because that lady hasn't even watched the film. Vivek said, have you watched the film? She said, no, I have not watched the film. <laughs> she is interviewing. And she's saying, why are you digging up things that are 30? I mean, this is bizarre. That means if some injustice has been done, some genocide happened 30 years ago, we should forget about it because it happened 30 years ago and we might find it bizarre and criminal to think like that. But here, and I may be held in contempt of Supreme Court, but I don't really care. I want to see what an Indian jail looks like. But the Supreme Court has done exactly that. Supreme Court has said that too much time has elapsed. So we will not open the cases of criminal, uh, uh, you know, uh, rape, murder of Kashmiri Hindus because too much time has elapsed. Can you imagine this is happening in our country? What sort of country are we living in? So uh, that journalist and the Supreme Court, I'm afraid, have the same bent of mind. Make it what you want to make of it. As yes. to your second question, as to why is it that the left leans to, I think there is a, it's a lot to be said about both philosophies. And left, in, in many ways, is a religious cult. And in many ways, it is also like Islam. It has a very prescribed 